God bless you, and thank you for joining us tonight here on the campus of New Faith Temple for our weekly Bible study. We're grateful to God for the privilege to share with you the Word of God, and we're thankful to all, grateful and thankful for all of you that join us on a weekly basis, those who join us on the campus, as well as those who are tuning in on our social media platforms. We're in the city of Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our pastor is the administrative assistant, Dietrich Tupper, his evangelist Natasha Tupper is his wife, and we are blessed again to be saved, and we're grateful for the privilege to share God's word with you. Before we begin tonight, we're going to be talking from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, sharing some things with, with us from there tonight. But before we begin, if you would join us in a word of prayer. God, our Father, again, we thank you for this privilege to share your word. We thank you for all of those that have joined us tonight. We ask your blessing upon their lives, that this word will strengthen and encourage us and that we'll be determined to live for you regardless of what we have to face. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us and shed his blood that we might be saved. We honor him tonight, for you said there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. So we thank you for Jesus and all that he did, all that he went through to bring salvation and to bring eternal life to us. So we honor him tonight. We thank you for your many blessings. We pray for those that are on tonight that have needs, that their needs will be met. Those that are not saved, that their uh, eyes and understanding will open and they'll catch on by faith tonight and, and give their lives to you, that they might have the, have the life, obtain the life that you have provided for them through Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Again, we thank you for tuning in with us tonight, talking from James chapter four, verses one through six. Uh, gonna read those verses and we're gonna share some things with us and. Uh, that will help us tonight. Our verses says, from whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Verse two says, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because you ask not. Verse three, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Verse four, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Verse five, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So tonight we just wanna talk about overcoming quarrels and worldliness, overcoming quarrels and worldliness. That's what we wanna focus our thoughts on tonight. This chapter opens in verse one and asks a very important question to all who read it, especially to the followers of Christ, to all the followers of Christ. The question is, from whence come wars and fighting among you? The epistle is addressed to the Jewish Christian who no longer lived in Jerusalem, but are now scattered abroad. James writes to let them know that what they believe must affect and show in what they do. Like the Jewish Christians then, who had wars and fighting among themselves. Likewise today, we have and have heard of wars and fighting among Christians, among the followers of Christ. Some of the quarrels and fighting have been famous enough to make the headlines in newspapers, on our television, on our radio stations. Many, if not all of us, have had quarrels and fighting in our lives. But have you ever been in a quarrel or fight and asked yourself, where is it coming from? James in this chapter asked the Christians, the saints, the believers, and the followers of Christ, why are you fighting and quarreling with one another? The answer he gives is their lust are at war within them. In other words, he's telling them you're the cause. The, the words war and fighting are military terms, but he's not referring to a literal physical war, but, but he's speaking in spiritual terms. He's not speaking of nations or countries attacking each other, literally, but it's talking to groups of Christians who have, who have quarrels, fights, and strife between them. He tells them it is coming from within. It is, a result of their own, it is a result of their own desires. The answer James gives is not the answer we give. Our answer to where our fighting and strife among us come is usually pointing to something outside of us. We blame the other person. We blame things that were said. We blame actions that hurt us. James said the problem resides within us. Our war and fighting come from our own selfish hearts and desires. 
We have desires that are ruling our hearts and bodies. The reason given by James for war and fighting among people are true of relationships in all arenas of life, whether marital, political, religious, governmental, the cause can be traced back to the inward desires of those that are involved. Some famous men known for their deep thought had this to say to us, Lucian says all the evil which come upon man, revolutions and wars, stratagems and slaughters spring from desire. All these things have as their foundation head the desire for more. Plato said the sole cause of war and revolutions and battles is nothing other than the bodies and other nothing else than the body and its desires. That's Plato. Let me read that again. He said the sole cause of wars and revolutions and battles is nothing other than the body and its desires. Cicero says it is the it is insatiable desire which overturn not only individual men but whole families in which even bring down the state from desire there springs hatred schism, discord, seditions, and wars, desire is at the root of all the evil which runs life and which divide men. William Barclay, the, one of the biblical uh, commentators, state this. Uh, he said the New Testament is clear that this overmastering desire for the pleasure of this world is always a threatening danger to the spiritual life. It is the cares and riches and pleasures of this life which combine to choke the good seed. A man can become a slave to lust, that is desire and pleasure, and when he does, malice and envy and hatred enter into life. The ultimate choice in life lies between pleasing oneself and pleasing God, and a world in which men's first aim is to place themselves is a world which is a battleground of sav savagery and division when self is at the forefront. So it comes from our own desires. The problem we, is we have not conformed to the wisdom of God, but have conformed to the wisdom of the world. I'll explain in James chapter three, verses 14 through, verses 14 through 18, which tells us, which says, if we have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom is not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. From where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So that's James chapter three, verses 14 through 18. In 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse three, the apostle Paul, while instructing the saints on the conduct of those who were speaking in tongues, reveals this truth about God. He says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So we see here that war and fighting among people, especially the Christians, does not come from God. It is wrong for there to be fights, quarrels, and strife among Christian people, those who say we're following Christ. People are then obeying the wisdom of the world rather than submitting to God's wisdom. When there's strife, we're seeking our own physical pleasures, our own power, our own honor, our own reputation, or some other selfish goal. Get this, know this, quarrels and strife are completely out of place for the Christian family. And when such happens, we should immediately examine ourselves and the word of God to see where it's coming from. Then fix the problem, change so we don't damage the influence of the believer or of the unbeliever. We won't damage the church and its witness. We won't do damage to the community and those who are not saved and those who have been hurt and wounded by the fighting and quarrel, we'll have to, we have to stop it so that they can be healed. Verse two of our text, of our lesson verses says tonight, ye lust and ye have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. James uses words of literal warfare to draw attention to show the seriousness of the sin a quarreling and strife among Christians. The word desire and do not have are the same as covet and cannot obtain. Murder is the same as fighting and quarrel, quarreling. These words show the malice and animosity that exist in some arenas, for example, in some homes, in some churches, some workplaces, and in other places. Speaking to the Christians, though, he gave two reasons why 
they desire and have not. First, they do not ask. They do not ask God. This indicates that the prayer life of these Christians had died. They were not asking God for the things that they needed. A person must trust and call upon God in order to have his desires fulfilled. Men must call upon God because man's deepest and most restless desire is spiritual. Let me say that again. Men must call upon God because man's deepest and most restless desire is spiritual. Man is a spiritual being who is restless until his spirit is at peace with God. Man's spiritual desire and cravings can only be satisfied by the spirit of God. Again, man's spiritual desires and cravings can only be satisfied by the spirit of God. Man is not able to completely and always control his desires. Man must have the presence and power of God to control all his lust and desires. Man must trust and call upon God. Man must consult with God, that is talk to God, ask God wisdom, ask God's will, ask God if the desire is good or bad, ask God if the need is true, or is, a lust for, or is it a lust for pleasure or gratification. Man must commune and fellowship with God, walk with him, live and move in him, asking his direction, following his instruction, and will every step, and he must do so in every step of the way every day, not praying, not knowing God leads to temptation and wrongdoing. The second reason the Christian desire have not desire and have not is they pray amiss. The word amiss means praying wrongly, praying with wrong motive, not quite sure, inappropriate, out of place, out of right or proper course, not suitable or not as expected. Man can pray for the wrong reason with the wrong motive. When we desire something from God, we must desire it to glorify God. God desires communion and fellowship with us. God desires that we draw close to him, learning more and more about him, worshiping and serving him more and more. This is the way God is glorified by walking closely to him, honoring and praising his name. So whatever we desire from God, it must be to glorify him, drawing us closer to him and making him better known to others. In verse four of our lesson verses, James uses the word adulterous. The word is used to show that the relationship James is, talk, James is talking about is their spiritual relationship, which means that he is referring to one who is, is or has been unfaithful in his relationship with God. Jesus Christ holds his, holds his relationship with us in high regard. Our relationship with him is to be so close that it can be described only by the closeness and intimacy of marriage. In fact, our relationship with Christ can be even closer and more meaningful than marriage. We are to know and understand Christ just as we are to know and believe and understand our spouses. But with Christ, there's far more of a bond and relationship because Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, lives within us. We are to live, move, and have our beings in Christ, and, he, and he's to dwell in us. Our bond with Christ is so close that when we turn away from him to the world, it's like committing adultery, spiritual Adultery means that we turn away from God to the world, that we break our commitment to God and turn to other things, that we follow after things of the world instead of following after God. Spiritual adultery is idolatry, the worshiping of other gods. Spiritual adultery is unclean works and sinful behavior. Spiritual adultery is, is giving oneself to abominable, to abominable things. It is forgetting God and turning your back upon him. It is forsaking God. It is disbelief in Christ. It is being ashamed of Christ and his word. It is pursuing other things such as money, land, positions, possession, houses, power, honor, fame, or something else. More than we pursue Christ, spiritual adultery is not obeying the commandments of the Lord. We have a good example to learn from during the time of the judges. God, people were in and out, up and down in their obedience and faithfulness to him. Listen to what Judges chapter 2 verses 16 through 17 says. He said, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. Talking about God's people, Israel. But they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord. But they did not so. They didn't obey God. That word hearken means that they didn't listen. They did not obey, did not follow the instruction, did not keep the commandments, had little or no regard for what God said to them through the leaders that he sent, through the judges that he sent. Could this be the root of our problems today when we have quarrels and fighting among us 
as followers of Christ? This picture of spiritual adultery shows us just how meaningful God counts our relationship with Christ. It is a relationship of love, a bond of love that can be that can be the closest bond in all the world. If we turn away from Christ to the world, it cuts God's heart with the deepest of pain, a pain beyond description. God feels perfectly. Everyone who turns away from God, a backslide to the world, wears a sign on his back that says all that God is, says to all that God is unfair and he can't be trusted. He'll mistreat you when you come to him. It costs Jesus unbelievable pain to save us, the pain of the cross, the pain of bearing the wrath of God, the pain of God the Father forsaking him when he bore our sins. And it was all for us. We must not hurt him anymore. We must not crucify Christ anymore. We must not forsake him for the world anymore. Hebrews chapter six, verses four, beginning at verse four, I'm gonna read down through verse, verses 12. He tells us in Hebrews in this chapter, he said, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, like the doctrine of the baptism and laying on of hand, the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. He said, and this will we do if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made, more, made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. He said, if they should fall away, if they should backslide, uh, if they should fall away, let me read that again, verse 6, if they shall fall away, it says impossible. Well, let me go back, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Verse six says, if they shall fall away, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Verse seven says, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herb, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh upon it oft, and bringeth forth herb, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So the outcome of, of, uh, of our falling away is not good. But beloved, verse 9, he said, But beloved, we are persuaded by the things of you, things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So we don't want to our lives and our witness and our living for Christ to be uh, a, uh, an example of fighting and quarrels among us. We don't want our desires to be, we want to keep them under, under check, we want to keep them in con under control because we don't want the, the, there to be fighting among us, uh, divisions among us, those of us who say we're following Christ. And he lets us know, James lets us know where it comes from when it gets to that level where we're fighting one another. He said it comes from your own Desires is coming from within. Uh, we're trying to push our way or make our way. So let me read the verses to us again as we close. He says in verse 1 of chapter 4 of James, from whence come wars and fighting among you. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. You fight and war, yet ye have not because you ask not. Verse 3, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Verse 4, he says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he says, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So we see that uh, pride has crept, crept in when we are fighting among ourselves. Selfishness has come to the forefront. And, and we're trying to push our way, or trying to acquire it through our own lust. And we're not being the humble people and the example uh, of men and women that, that show that we love God. Amen. That's our lesson for tonight. We want to overcome quarrels and worldliness. Thank you for tuning in. Join me with a word of prayer as we close out. God, we thank you for this word. We pray that it will settle into our hearts and minds and will strengthen us as we examine our lives in the light of it. And if we be found wanting, God, that we'll repent and eliminate those things that's, that's causing quarrels and division among us from our lives, that we might be able to love one another and serve you in unity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you next week. God bless you. Be glorified. Be glorified. You get the glory. You get the praise. You take the honor. I just want to say that.